So I asked Romero, uh, how does it feel like to be an artist whose pieces last for two hours? <laughs> I said, would you like to have your work in a gallery? You know, would you like to have your work in a museum? And he said, yeah, of course. I'd like my father's job to be permanent. I'd like to make sure my cousins aren't going to be deported. But that's not the way the world works. So Romero has a different sense of time and the monumental uh, arc of art and history. He has an ephemeral sense of time because the unpredictability in the lives of low-wage workers, especially those who are non-citizens, requires a constant improvisation and negotiation with the here and now. Uh, often in the university, in the art world, we're thinking about how people can get from A to Z. Uh, but for people living their lives, it might be a miracle to imagine how you can get from A to B. How you can wake up and have something, uh, some reason the next day uh, to narrate yourself uh, into the world in a way that gives you the dignity. But Romero and row houses and the other art I want to talk about isn't just about providing a different commentary on the world that exists. It's a provocation to rearrange spaces and social relations. Romero goes out and puts these objects in space because he thinks they can do meaningful work. He thinks that they can capture uh, the, the imagination, that they can capture people's eyes, and they can create new kinds of social relations. One of his big uh, happenings, one of his big triumphs, was during the uh, uh, election campaign when there was a, a cocktail party at George Clooney's house in Beverly Hills to raise money for the Obama presidency. And there was supposed to be uh, valet parking uh, for that. And Ramiro had a friend call some of the valets and said they were wanted inside the house. And then he put up uh, images of Latino valets with a sign saying, I'm on a break. Ballet yourself. <laughs> and part of what he's trying to do is to interrupt the common sense of everyday life. The fact that you ride by a wealthy neighborhood and the person and the machine have the same name, a leaf blower. There's a leaf blower. Is that a person? Is that a machine? Is that the job? And you don't see them. And for legal reasons, they may not want you to see them. You learn not to see them. You learn to pass by. That's not a leaf blower. That's Manuel. That's Jose. That's Ramiro's cousin. That's somebody with a history and a life. That's somebody who you have to work out your destiny in this world with. It's somebody upon whom the high consumption lifestyles of the California professional class depends and yet they, they never see them drive by them. A Romero wants you to look twice. He's like that group of art activists at Dodo Lab in Sudbury, Ontario, who tried to call attention and interrupt the logic of street signs. There was a sign in a local park that said, uh, uh, no cats, no dogs, no drinking, no golfing. That was the sign. And as they thought about this, they said, why is this sign needed? I guess before it was here, the city suffered from cats and dogs playing golf and getting drunk. <laughs> and they needed a sign to prohibit it. So they dressed up as uh, moose and deer and played croquet and drank Gatorade so that the city would see that its policies were being fully implemented. But part of what they were dealing with this endless disciplinary discourse that you encounter, especially working class youth, to uh, pull your pants up and uh, turn your cap around, uh, but we have no job for you, we have no education for you, uh, we have no respect for your parents who we consider to be chumps, we have no regard for the beauty and history of your community. And this was a way for them to speak back to that disciplinary language. Now, this means that art is, of course, not simply ornamentation and refinement. It's not simply reparations for the spiritual deprivations of capitalism. It's an art that is a repository of collective memory. It's the people's archive. The people who don't own uh, the libraries have the art to tell their story and their history. The visual art, the music, the 
the way they talk, all of this is an archive. Walter Brissett, the great, great, Cliff, great Cliff Ojibwe Indian activist, used to say, you know, it's funny, uh, Americans have great libraries with short memories. And he says, you know, with the Ojibwe, it's the opposite. We don't have any libraries, but we have long memories. And have long memories because the past has not fully gone away. So art is a repository of collective memory, a site of moral instruction, a means of calling a community into being through performance. When I try to talk about this work in the academic world, in the art world, there's a category for it. And they say, oh, George, yeah, you're talking about um, community-based art making. And by community-based, they mean not as good. Uh, by community-based, they often mean entry-level forms of art, like silkscreen. And they already have a, uh, a niche, uh, a category. There's a canyon of echoes. So once that category is established, that's all. You know, this is what you are, and this is the only thing that you can be. And I always try to tell them this is not community-based art making. This is art-based community making. That's something different, and it's something important. And this is art made by people often who nobody invited to be an artist. Mm -hmm. They had to invite themselves to the park. And they had to make their own definition of what art would be. And it's not only the form that they take has everything to do with their history and the tools at their disposal. People fight with the tools they have in the arenas that are open to them. If you can, if you can influence uh, a political campaign by writing a check, that's what you do. But if you, if you can only sit down in front of traffic and block it with a picket sign, that's what you do. And it's the same thing in art. If you have access to certain kinds of uh, artistic technologies and devices, you think a lot about what can be done with those. But no matter how small thing you have access to, there's always a solution. Every problem has a solution. Something can be done. I like these small houses doing big work in the third ward because it makes me think of all the important work that's been done in small spaces. Those of you who've read Harriet Jacobs' Incidents from the Life of a Slave Girl, she's in a little attic. She can see out of a small window. She gets a lot done in that attic. She sees a lot from that little space. She doesn't need to have uh, the panopticon. She doesn't need to have uh, the view from the jungle jet. She's in a little space, but she gets a lot done in there. Trisha Rose writes about young people in the South Bronx in the 1970s and 80s, displaced by urban renewal from Manhattan, from Brooklyn, from Queens. And in the South Bronx, in new neighborhoods, uh, they had uh, very little to socialize with except the memories of their parents' vinyl record collections. And so they used uh, turntables to turn those record collections inside out. They find a break beat and they make a, a 10 minute song out of, a, out of a little beat. They take a piece of linoleum and they do a 360 spin on their heads in that little space and get a lot done showing their artistry and their mastery. I have to describe this for you. I used to be able to do this myself in the talks, but 360 spin on linoleum. It's getting a lot done in a small space. And we're, when we come here, we love the form, we love the architecture, we love, we love the art, we love the way it reminds us of John Bigger's paintings. But some people have a different way of expressing their art. And what I want to present to you now, uh, again, like from your own, this is not being done by black people. But it's always black to me, no matter who the artist is, because it's a black way of thinking about art, about action, about ideas, about the relations among people in the world, about making things happen. In December of 2012, a little more than a year ago, there were protests all across Canada by indigenous people about a new law being introduced by the Canadian government that would devastate the rights to uh, natural resources of indigenous peoples throughout Canada. And the movement that emerged out of this was called Idle No More. People wanted to be idle no more. They wanted to get up and move. And so movement had to be in their activity. And because they spoke different indigenous languages, because the printed word had not been an ally of theirs, because the treaties that allegedly protected their access to the land had been disregarded, 
They didn't want to write manifestos or make speeches. So what they did was find spaces to dance in large clockwise circles, to demonstrate their ability to work together, to breathe together, their potential to disrupt things. And they wanted to use these gatherings as a way of announcing that the uh, society that was ignoring them was built on their exploitation. And that the things that that society valued were wrong. They wanted to find value in things that were undervalued, and they want to question things that other people value. So where do you do this? Where do you congregate? A century ago, they might have gone to the town square. They might have gone to the legislature. In Houston, you know, they went to the shopping mall. The mall is where the people are. And the mall is where the true religion of the society, where the, 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 the true uh, worship of uh, products rather than people takes place. And in these malls, they try to disrupt them by showing that this love of things over people and over the earth was destructive. So here's a little bit of a flash mob at the WBM Mall in Edmonton, Alberta, in which indigenous people try to make an argument that can't be answered try to stage an event that they control, try to an event that's eloquent and articulate even though it doesn't use any words. So let's look at the second. Let's see. Thank you. 